What's up, folks? Thank y'all for tuning into the Josh Terry podcast. Uh, I'm not even going to take a long intro on this. I want to thank all the sponsors. I want to thank everybody listening. This is a part three. Uh, I don't know how many part threes I've done. Uh, I think there might be a couple in the first couple years, but usually I don't give many people three chances to entertain me. Um, that's kind of like my love life. Uh, ta -ta, that's a dad joke. Cause I'm single and lonely as hell. Ah, they don't, they don't come back to me. I keep trying to go back to them. Um, it's also a joke. Um, this episode is starting off real good. Anyway, so two weeks ago we did an episode with Miss Kayla. Um, if y'all guys didn't get a chance to go listen to those episodes, um, I believe they were titled um for Nolan, weren't they, Kayla? Nolan and all first responders. That's what it was. Um. And uh, we didn't get to finish up that episode. And I promised Kayla when I got back from Nashville that we would record. This was the first available day. We got a chance to finish that story. So if you haven't cried enough and you haven't uh, messaged me or Kayla enough about that episode, which, by the way, everybody that did, um, big shout out to Daniel Riley. Uh, Daniel, um, he's a lieutenant, by the way. He made sure to correct me through text message. He is not a chief. He's a lieutenant. And uh, he wanted me to make sure – that uh, I knew that, not being an asshole or nothing. He was just being playful. But uh, he actually wanted to do this episode with us, but it was on sh such short notice, there was no way he could do it. But he wanted me to personally thank you. Um, he said that he spent, and this is a tough dude. Like Daniel is a tough dude. Uh, he said that he spent three hours crying. And that episode meant so much to him, and it touched him so much. And I know from the messages that I've received from other people and – some of the messages that you've told me about and some of the interaction you've had since that. Uh, and we haven't even released like none of the clips and stuff. If anybody's wondering why we haven't released any clips, I wanted to wait until we got done with this episode and we're just going to bombard uh, social media with it. So Kayla, I want to thank you for coming back and hanging out and us finishing this up. But uh, I also just want to thank you being tough and strong and sharing the story. Cause I, I can already tell that it's helping people. I, I appreciate you so much for doing this. And to your Lieutenant friend, um, if you have any questions or want to talk or whatever, please do not hesitate to reach out to me. Even if you want to give him my cell phone number, that's totally fine too. Um, I know, I know this field is, it has its good and bad days. It has its, its ups and downs. And at the end of the day, like we're all on the same team and the only goal is to make it home at night, whether it's from work or from our own personal stuff. And that is, that has been my main goal with telling the story is not only to keep, you know, Nolan's memory and honor his life and service, but to make sure people know that they're not alone. Cause yeah. I have had, I've had a very lonely journey in the beginning of this and it has led me to some of the coolest people, uh, you included, like well, we never were you. friends over this. Um, so I have, I have met some great people along the way. Uh, obviously they don't fill the void of him being gone, but I'm very grateful for just the contacts I've made and, you know, telling his story and having people, I had a guy comment on one of my videos. It was right after Nolan died. And one of the hashtags I used was please stay. And he sent me a message and he was like, that alone made me rethink my choices. He was like, I want to stay. He's like, I don't want anybody else to hurt this way or the way that you are that we see you hurting. And I was like, oh, well, oh pe goodness. well, people just don't understand. Like, and I think I tried to, just beat this home with people in the first episode and so many episodes that I've done. And it is, you're not alone and you just don't realize that people are there for you like this. It could be strangers, it, but the thing is, unless you put yourself out there, 
you just don't know. I don't know if I told you this, and I might have told it. So if I'm resharing the story, I'm sorry. One of the scariest days of my life was about 2015 or 16. And it was when I decided to talk publicly about my suicide attempt. Um, did I talk about this on the first episode? I think we touched on it a little bit. It may have been outside of the okay. episode. Um, but I was scared to death to do it. But it was weighing so heavy on my heart that I had to do it. And this was before I was anything on social media. Like this was just me as a normal person, not working in radio, not doing nothing. Just, I, I had a four or five year old kid and it's just, it weighed so heavy on me because I knew some people knew about it. I knew some people didn't. So I decided one night to post something about it on social media. And the, my thinking of it was, is if you're going to call me crazy behind my back, or if it's something that you already know about me, I'm going to own it to where I can put it behind me. And if you think I'm crazy or whatever for, for trying to commit suicide or whatever, at least you're going to know why. And then maybe we can move on and I don't have that monkey on my back anymore. Well, that's not what happened. What happened was the second that I posted it, it blew up. And when it blew up, there were so many people that I would have never expected. I'm talking about people that I would have never in a million years reach out to me and be like, dude, I was the happiest person in high school. I was dealing with the same shit you were. He's like, I almost did it. Or she was like, I almost, I almost did it. And I've been there. Thank you for sharing because you're sharing. I don't feel bad about myself. I don't feel alone now. And it literally is what catapulted me into my career now. That's why I try to tell people the worst moments in your life could be what make you. Me sharing the, 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 my suicide attempt is what led to me being who I am today because it's what I'm supposed to do. Anytime I do an episode on mental health awareness, anytime I post anything on mental health, anytime that I do a show with somebody like you, are you social media famous? No, I'm doing a show later with somebody that a movie's about on Netflix and a book's about or whatever. And that'll be a great episode. Don't get me wrong. But this right here is how I know that when you share and you make public the worst things that you have been through, your pain is your purpose. Like the, the reason why you're still here is because you're supposed to be. Your battle, and every, everybody wants to say it's cliche that God gives his toughest battles to his strongest soldiers. It's because you're supposed to learn from that shit. You're supposed to help other people. You are supposed to pay it forward. You're still standing because you're supposed to be still standing. And when I tell you people all the time that it, like I've survived shit that it, it would have taken most people out. Yeah. Like just with the Nolan thing alone, like I, I don't even know how, I mean, I, I do know a little bit now, but at the time I'm like, I don't know how I'm going to make it through this and just sharing his story. I've gotten both sides of that of, you know, I've had people tell me that his story helped them. Yeah. I just, I, I started going to meetings with like one tribe. I just started this week, um, which for any first responder veteran, whatever, highly recommend them. Um, I had a great experience, but you know, one of them happens to be, family that are directly, directly affected by suicide. And I did my first meeting with them last night. And this one lady, I, you know, cause I was a new, new person there. So they had me share like, you know, why I was there or whatever. Her story is almost identical to mine. Yeah. And I was like, you know, holy shit. Like my heart breaks for her, but it also at the same time was comforting to know that the things that I've been feeling and the roller coaster I've been on isn't like, I'm not crazy. I'm not losing my mind. No. I'm not you know, it's like, okay, this is, this is a normal reaction. This is something that, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not losing my marbles trying to get through this. And she's like, I think she said five and a half years since her husband's death. And I'm just like, okay, so, so I'm not like, this is normal. It's a really messed up normal and it's a really shitty club to be in, but, you know, just meeting these people that it's like, I hate that they know the pain, but it's comforting to know that they understand. Yeah. it's And that's how you have to look at it though. And once again, I say a lot of cliche shit, uh, cliche. Sh I like everything simplified. Uh, people give me shit about this all the time, but I like simple. Keep it simple. Stupid. Mm -hmm. When something's simple, everybody can get it. Right. 
it, you have to be glass half full because it's already happened. You can't, there's no change in it. There's no going back. There's no altering the past. There's what can you do from knowing what you know now? What can it do? All these women were last night. It was just, it was, and I told them this. I said, I hate that y'all know this pain. I said, but I love how everybody now has kind of the mentality that I have, which Nolan's mom brought this up. She was like, I love it that you're just like, fuck it. I'm like, what am I going to do? Change, change what already happened. I can't. So fuck it. Let's just roll with it. And most people that are, that are in similar situations, they're just like, it is what it is. You know, I can't fix it. I can just take that next step forward. Yeah. Yeah. It's you, there's nothing else you can do. I yeah. mean, there, there's nothing. Um, not trying to put my mom, which she probably don't listen to much of this shit anyway, but my mom, when my grandmother, my ninny, my, one of my favorite people of all time, she passed away when I was in seventh grade. So it's been a long time. This is like Oh one, right? My mom let that define the rest of her life. My mom is, I don't know how old she is. She's still kicking. But she's let every bad decision, every mistake, every tear, everything that has happened to her since my grandmother died, my ninny, be the reason why she's done anything, right? Like it crippled her. And I hate that for her because if anybody would have known my ninny, that she would have beat my mama's ass. Like when my papa passed away, like uh, it was Christmas morning to almost three years ago now. I had this about three, four month period to where I just let it eat me up. I miss my hero. Like I, but I was like, you know what? He'd beat the shit out of me. If I was sad any longer because he got to live the life that he wanted to. Like he, he went out. I mean, he, but he lived. And I started thinking about the difference between me and my mama. And it was like, you know what? I'm not going to let this cripple me the way she has. And a lot of people that when it comes to suicide, because someone's took so soon or they took when you're not expecting it. And neither one of my family members were, by the way, it was both illnesses, but you have a choice to make. And that's with any death. It's, are you going to let this be the thing that cripples you? That's going to put you right there in the ground next to them. Even if you're still living, you're still in the ground next to them because that's where your mentality is. Or, are you going to be the kind of person that it defines the rest of your life for good, not for, not for bad. And most of those women and, and even you now, like it's, you're not letting it define you. Well, and that's one of those things that, you know, part of that, part of that last conversation that I had with him, you know, leading up to his death, um, you know, we were talking and, you know, I was like, I can't do this life without you. And he said, you'll be fine once you pick up those pieces. And one, one thing, you know, one of those last promises he made me make was that I would live a good life no matter what. And I think part, yes, part of me died with him that day. The Kayla, I was, you know, with him and before him and all that part of me died with him that day. And I'm okay with that because he had a piece in me that no one else will ever get. And, you know, that, that last promise of that, I was going to live a good life. I, I told, I told some of my friends, you know, it's going to take me a minute to recover. It's going to take me a minute to heal and grieve and all that stuff, but I'm going to stand by that promise. Yeah. You know, I've got three babies that are watching everything that I do. Um, you know, they, they've watched me grieve. They've watched, you know, I just had the other day, um, which we'll get into that as far as why I was a, a hot mess, but you know, I sat right here at my desk and I was in tears and my teenager came up when he put his arm around me and he hugged me and let me cry. You know, I was like crying. <laughs> I never thought I'd be crying into my son's chest, but you know, yeah. he sat there and he held me and, you know, did what he could to comfort me. And my middle, my middle one came up. She's, she's 10. She came up from behind, put her arm around the other shoulder and they both told me they love me. And it's just, you know, they're, they're learning the process of grief too, as well as like how to comfort somebody, how to be there. And because I think that's an important part of it too, for when they get older and relationships and, even just as their mom, you know, having, having some sort of comforting mentality, I think is important to teach kids too. And, you know, they're getting, they're getting some hard life lessons, but we're, we're trying to make the best of it. And I'm trying to hold to that promise of living a good life and not letting it cripple me completely. I mean, I've had good days. I've had bad days. Um, I've had days where I'm still sitting on the floor in my bedroom where Nolan and I, I don't know what it was with us. We'd sit on the floor and we just have these like deep ass conversations. Yeah. 
And I still find myself sitting on the floor crying, you know, sometimes yelling at him, like he's still sitting in front of me, but <laughs> you know, taking, taking the time to process those emotions. Yes. And, you know, sit with my grief and my anger and my sadness, but ultimately it's like, let the tears come, get it out. And then we're back, we're back up and dusting our, dusting our boots off and ready to go. Yeah. Well, that's the way so. you got to be. I mean, and I, and I'm proud of you for doing that. And I think he'd be proud of you for doing that. I, I think he would too. He, he was definitely more, uh, vulnerable than I was in the beginning. He was, he was very okay with being vulnerable with me. And I was so closed off in general, um, that I didn't, I didn't like talking about emotions. I didn't like doing any of that. And, you know, my therapist told me before any of this happened, she said, you got 20 years worth of shit. That's going to come out. At some point. <laughs> and sure enough, no one was the catalyst of that. She even said, she's like, you know, this isn't just grief over his death. This is like, you're allowing yourself to cry and like yeah. feel something other than anger. She's like, it's, it's going to be new. She's like, but the flood, the floodgates are opening basically. And he taught me a lot about that, of that it's, it's okay to be vulnerable, even if it's just by yourself. Yeah. I wish there were some more women that would learn that. Uh, I know a couple that, uh, one in particular that I wish would be okay with being vulnerable. Uh, but yeah, that shit is not ever happening. Um, that's the touchy subject. Hey, I'm, I'm vulnerable as shit. Like I, but this also too, uh, I just learned like a long time ago, it's, I can't, I'm not capable of keeping anything bottled up. Like it's so unhealthy that I probably overshare. Um, I overthink, but I figured out kind of, if you ask in the, and I just recently learned this cause I would do it in an unhealthy way till recently, but I would overthink to the point of asking something in a way that would almost seem like I'm accusing you of something just because of my insecurities or my thought process to where some now do what some of it's projection. Yeah. Some of it's projection. Um, and like, it's just, I'm I've got so much better over it in the past couple of months where it's like, if I have an issue now, it's okay. I'm going to word it in a certain way. It's like, look, I might be in my head about this. I hope you don't think I'm being crazy. I'm not accusing you or anything. This is how the situation looks. I'm sorry. Please don't think I'm accusing anything. This is just how I want you to understand how I feel and how it looks. But people have took me being vulnerable and used it against me. So that's why men don't like being vulnerable. Men hate being vulnerable and I get it. I won't stop doing it because it's healthy for me, but I get it. I get it. And I, I know a really lot of women that have weaponized it and, yeah. it. and it's like, for one, they give the rest of us a bad name. And for the men that have had to deal with that, I'm very sorry. Um, not all of us are like that, but like, I'm, I'm that person that I'm, I'm okay with being with people that are vulnerable. I'm like, give me all your problems. Let me help you shoulder the weight of it, whatever the case is. But then when those tables turn, I have this deer in the headlights look of what do you mean you want me to, <laughs> I'm terrified of this. Yeah. And especially with my job, we get, we, we get preached about obviously about mental health and whatnot. And it, it is important. But they don't teach you how to do it. And everybody is so different that I'm a, I'm a huge believer in, you know, one-on-one -on -one therapy, group therapy, you know, finding stuff that works for you, seeing examples of it, of like, okay, this, this part will work for me, but this one won't. Yeah. Um, obviously you don't want to go down the path of, well, I'm going to try this and I'm going to force myself to do it. And then it ends up hurting you in the long run. Yeah. Uh, this, this isn't, this makes me uncomfy and I don't, I don't like this part, but it's so, it's so hard to have some blanket guideline Absolutely. for any of that, whether it's vulnerability, whether it's, you know, I need to sit with my emotions or I need to, I need to go for a walk. I need to write it down, whatever the case is. Believe me, I've tried a little bit of everything at this point. <laughs> Hell, we all have. It's well, like, therapy was like the gateway drug. And now I'm just like, oh, let's try something new. Like, let's, let's see if this works. You know, it, it's I, a good thing. Oh, I get it way more than you <laughs> understand. Oh, uh, well, cool. Well, let's jump back into, did you, do you get know where we left off? Cause I'm pretty sure you've already got it written down. I do not have it in front of me. It's on my desk. I did. I did write it down. Um, so the last part we ended on was talking about the first call or one of the first calls that I ran, um, when I first went back to work and it was that little girl that was, oh yeah. Stolen. Um, it was, it was emotional. Obviously I, I had, 
I had mixed feelings about it. I was obviously devastated with my own heartbreak, but I was so grateful that I got to be the one to be there. Yeah. Um, just for the simple fact, like as a mom, as a provider, you know, as somebody who just dealt with this kind of heartbreak, it was, it was a nice reminder of why I do the job that I do. Yeah. And, you know, I had somebody when I was in paramedic school, the one thing they said to me, um, that has stuck with me for my entire career. And it's, he said, just because you have the knowledge and the skill set to save everyone doesn't mean you're meant to. Ooh, I like that. And I was like, you know, I didn't understand it until I truly started working in this field and seeing it firsthand of, I think that's kind of helped me cope a lot with losing patients. Mm -hmm. Um, I fortunately have had a really lucky track record and the running joke is, you know, we're just there to entertain the Grim Reaper until he makes up his mind. And that's, it's the truest thing ever because I could have somebody in front of me that, you know, all their vital signs, everything that's going on is like, this person's going to die. Like there's nothing I can do about it. And, you know, it was the same kind of thing when Nolan died, uh, watching him take that last breath and looking back on it. I had such a hard time with the fact that, you know, I'm a paramedic. It's my job to keep people alive. And I finally took a step back and looked at like the science side of it. He could have done that with me standing next to him and he would not have survived. Yeah. I I could have been, you could have had a trauma doctor standing next to him when he did it ready to work. And the chances of him, him surviving are pretty much none. Um, just based on, you know, where the shot was fired at and it, you know, it's, it's part of life. It's, it's part of, you know, the nature of what goes on with not only mental health, but our job and physiologically. And there's so many moving parts that I, it took looking at each one individually to understand, but that little girl just was a hard reminder, like a good harsh reminder of why I do this, why most of us do this. And it was, it was heartbreaking, but if I ever see that little girl again, you better believe I'm going to hug her like she's my own baby. <laughs> that is precious to me. Um, <laughs> you know, you're not meant to save everybody. Um, when you, the more you figure out who you are, the more that you actually get in tune with yourself and the stuff you've been through, the more you probably start gravitating towards the people you're supposed to save. Like I know in your field, that's kind of different, right? But like, like I keep telling you, you know, just because you're EMT, that don't mean that's your job. Like you, you have a, you have an earthly job. We all have an earthly job. I'm a podcaster. I host events. I pretend to write music. Uh, you know, that's, that's my earthly shit, but that's not necessarily my job. You know, that might be what I get paid for and you might get paid to be an EMT but I think that there's those moments like with that little girl and the other things that the other people that you've talked to, that's probably more of your job. If that makes sense. Like I know I'm being vague about that, but like your soul's job. Yeah. That's your soul's job. That's probably a good way to put it. Like that's what you're supposed to be doing. Like, and that's where you get fulfillment. A paycheck to me isn't like, trust me, we all got to have money. I mean, it's just shit, but that's not fulfillment to me. Like, well, there's moments to where something happens in my life to where it, it makes being broke okay. It makes a struggle okay. It makes whatever okay. It makes the bad days okay. And I'm like, okay. Because we're not put here. Like, we're not put here to work a nine to five. We were not put here to, uh, to have the nicest cars. We were not put here to keep up with the Joneses. We were not put here to compete with our neighbors. We were not. We were put here to worship, to live, to laugh, and to love. That's what we would do. And to take care, to be our brother's keeper. That's what we were put here for. And you have a job to where you get to do all that. But I'm sure there are some days and there are some people around that you're actually doing more of your job than what you're actually doing other days. Oh, 100%. And it's, that's, if you ask anybody why they became, you know, first responder in general, it's not for the paycheck. I can tell you that much. <laughs> like, pretty ghetto sometimes. Yeah. Um, for for the way that we work and how hard most of us work, it, believe me, it ain't for the paycheck. Um, but it's like most of, we love our job. We love what we do. It, it, it keeps us going back to work. Um, 
it's one of those things that, you know, that fulfillment comes from, I even tell people I've got, you know, some burnt out medic friends are not really burnt out, but you know, they're tired, like most of us. And they talk about running like, you know, the local crackheads down the road. I personally don't mind it. And they have become some of my favorite people because some of them have the craziest stories. Now, some of it could be made up. I don't know, but either way, 10 points for creativity. Um, but it's like you, you meet these people one for a reason. And two, I mean, I've had my days too, where I look at those call notes. I'm like, you gotta be fucking kidding me. Mm-hmm. Like stay psych right now. And you know, we still go. Cause obviously that's our job. And it has turned out to be some, like I've gotten life lessons from some of these people. Yeah. And you know, I tell, I tell every time I have a student, I tell them all the time, you know, try to learn at least one thing from that call. It doesn't have to be EMS related. I don't even care if it's a life lesson you know, or just the don't do drugs, like something, take something from it. And, you know, it's, that's been my biggest saving grace as far as this whole journey, as far as being, I've been in healthcare since 2006 for the love of God, I've seen a lot. Um, but it's, it's what you take from it and what you can give back in the process. That's cool. Now let's keep moving forward with this story. Because uh, if I just keep giving like my thoughts and everything on shit, we're going to get bogged down. Uh, <laughs> if we get bogged down some more, who gives a shit? Uh, I'll have somebody message me and be like, how long was that episode? Um, but fuck it. If it's good, it's good. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah. I'm just glad you have that mindset, though. Uh, you are. You're special. Um, uh, but yeah. But let's keep moving forward. So... This was, uh, I'll, I'll share this with you just because I know there's going to be some parts that we're probably going to be crying again. And this will, this will make you laugh. Um, when I first met Nolan, I, I wanted no part of a relationship. I was like, absolutely not. You are smoking crack. If you think I'm going to date someone. Yeah. And he, he did not give up. This man was like, he was like the Kool-Aid man, uh, just barged on in. And the pickup line that he used on me, was the first man that has ever rendered me speechless to where I had no comeback. Cause I, I will run my mouth like it's my job. Yeah. And he came up to me and he was, you know, kind of getting flirty. And I looked at him or I was looking up at him. Cause he's like seven, eight inches taller than me. I said, Nolan, I said, listen to me. Cause I just got out of a nasty, toxic relationship. And I said, I am in my toxic phase. You don't want no part of this, like save yourself kind of deal. Right. This man looked me dead in my eyeballs, straight face and everything and said, well, if you're in your toxic face, I'm trying to be dead center at Chernobyl. Ah, that's good. And I looked at him and I said, what? That's some like, shit I'd say. say. That's some shit I'd say. I he, would probably say like toxic Avenger or something like that. <laughs> he did. He actually had me in his phone as Chernobyl for the longest time. That's funny. That was my nickname forever. Um, but that was that was the fun, the fun little way I actually, our relationship started. What's funny is I actually call a girl that, but it's completely completely different reason <laughs> and i'm not i'm not sharing that on the podcast we'll talk about that later yeah yeah she's <laughs> a good time i love it i love it and I, it's just one of those where, like when you find when you find the toxic that works for you it, I just know, it, it does not work for me but <laughs> more power to whoever it does <laughs> yeah yeah he, uh, he's a good one and that was that was how our relationship started but you know, it was, it was a wild ride. It was a roller coaster. Obviously, you know, after his death, um, going back to work was a huge hurdle. Yeah. I walked into my shift and my first shift back. And luckily I was, I was with one of my best friends who was actually Nolan's partner. Um, you know, he got to handhold me through that. But when I walked in, it was, you know, I had supervisors that I was, you know, I was on good terms with, I was cool with, we talked, you know, we, we had a work friendship and I walked in and it was like the red sea parted. It just, you know, people wouldn't look at me. They wouldn't talk to me. Obviously rumors had flown, which I don't really give two shits about rumors. Um, which I knew they were going to happen. People were like, Oh, that's, you know, Kayla was a side chick and she broke up Nolan's marriage and this, that, and the other, Nolan was already separated. Like we, he had moved out. Like I helped him move out because we were friends, but a lot of it was, you know, it's Kayla's fault. No one looked at the other half of it, which everyone knew what was going on, you know, good old work rumors, but I was made out to be like, it was like, I had a scarlet letter on me. Yeah. And I did nothing. One, I don't touch married men. Like that's, that's not my thing. Yep. 
And, you know, they made it out. Like, you know, I was just like, I had the plague when I was walking by supervisors that wouldn't even say good morning. Like, What the fuck is this? Like, okay. And then I thought about it. I said, okay, well, you know, this is a weird situation. Maybe they just don't know what to say. You know, every, it, it rocked all of us like losing him. So, you know, I brushed it off and I was like, okay, whatever. Well, it just kept happening. And finally it was like my first or second week back. And I walked by a supervisor that, you know, I worked numerous shifts with him as my direct supervisor and we had a good relationship and I walked by and he's like, Hey, how's it going? And I was like, Hey, and I was on my way out. Cause he was a night, he was a night supervisor. So I was leaving and he was coming in and he stopped. Like he just a deer in the headlights and he turned back and he goes, no, no, no. He's like, how are you really doing? And I stopped and I looked, I think this was the same day that I ran that little girl. And he's like, how are you really doing? And I just looked at him and I was like, I'm sitting in the same seat that I watched him die. And how do you, how the fuck do you think I'm doing? And I just looked at him and I just started crying and everyone knows Kayla is not a big crier, especially mm-hmm. in public. And he just looked at me, you know, we had this, we both had this shock expression on our face, just looking at each other. And he's like, please, if you need anything, he's like, please don't hesitate to call me. He was the first and only supervisor that stopped me at work to even ask how I was doing even on a like surface level damn, for probably a month. Why was that? I have no idea. Well, at the time I had no idea. I found out later on um, why this happened. Um, so the supervisor that had, that was on shift that I was calling to try to get to Nolan. Um, he has a history of, he has a history of sending inappropriate pictures to the female employees. You'll have that. Uh, Yeah. And he, uh, the running joke is that, you know, he's useless other than playing solitaire at the hospital and sending dick pics to the the females. And so I was like, okay, whatever. And, you know, I've, I've got proof of it. Nobody, none of my higher ups wanted to see it. Cause I said, this has got to be a conflict of interest. There's a reason he roadblocked me from getting there. Yeah. My mind, you know, I said, let me, let me blast everybody. I was on a war path. I'm not going to lie. I was, I was not a nice person to be around. Um, I didn't go out of my way to be mean to anybody, but I definitely had a vibe about me of like, like I should have had a sign that was like, not friendly, do not pet. Just because I just, I, I know I had that look on my face and I know I was giving off those vibes. Well, you're, gr- have, you're still grieving though. Like, yeah. and, and grief, I don't have the stages of grief in front of me, but I'm pretty sure one of them's anger. Mm-hmm. Denial. Like- um, was it denial, bargaining, anger, um, acceptance. There, there's a whole list of them, but anger is one of the top ones. Denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. Yep. And, and I was definitely, I, and the weird thing with this is, you know, I've, I've done the grief thing before losing family members, but this was like a ping pong ball. I couldn't get through one stage of grief and process it to get to the next. Like it was just like one minute I'd be angry. The next minute I'm in tears. The next minute I'm like in denial and then I'm back to being angry. And I, I know that part of that was me. I can own up to that. Um, but to have, you know, supervisors and stuff, like these are people I'm supposed to rely on. These are people that are supposed to support us through an already tough career. Yeah. You know, these are our leaders. They are supposed to be, you know, leading us into battle, essentially. Like it's, that's what they're there for. And to be completely ignored was like, it was heartbreaking. Like it's, I was like, I have nobody here. And yeah, that would have hurt anybody. Yeah. And I know, I know I come across as kind of like a cold hearted bitch sometimes. I know that um, it's a defense mechanism. I'm working on it in therapy. Um, but it was, I, I, I'm so it depends. It depends on what you're cold about. Like, I hate when people say that. Like, and I know you're not saying it in a bad way about yourself or whatever. But, like, okay, if I stand up for myself in a situation, I'm known as a, not a badass, badass the wrong way, but like, People like me because I'm blunt. People mm-hmm. like me because I like if I'll say some shit to your face and people's like, damn, Josh tells it how it is. If you don't know anything else about him, I can respect him because he tells it how it is. I don't like that when women do that, they're all of a sudden they're hard mm-hmm. to deal with or they're a bitch or something like that. That's not OK. You're just standing your ground and telling people how you feel. My thing is, I don't just stand up for my stuff myself. I will stand up for other people. And yeah, if I hear I someone talking ugly about someone that doesn't deserve it, I'm like, hold on, I'm time out. 
Same the way. fuck are you doing saying anything? Like, d- yeah. glass houses shouldn't throw stones because now I'm going to throw a whole ass boulder at yours. Absolutely. And you- well, and I know sometimes, like, I don't have the most finesse when it comes to certain things that I will just call it like it is. Yeah. Like, I, the filter from my brain to my mouth did not show up in shipping and handling sometimes. But it's, you know what I mean? Like, I, I know the label that I have. And come to find out, me and one of my best friends apparently were, like, the two top most hated people in the field <laughs> which is fine and this has come from like multiple people obviously hearsay because I, we both are very blunt i will not put up with your bullshit i will not tolerate your bullshit of you bad mouthing somebody that doesn't deserve it and you know if you're spreading rumors that aren't true everyone calls me the queen of receipts too like if i've got proof of it you better believe i'm pulling it up because i'm a ninja with that search bar <laughs> Check with it. and people know that and so when i started blasting this whole thing when i came back and I started blasting this whole thing about how like there's got because I was angry and I was looking for someone to blame. And so when I came back and I was like, fuck that, this supervisor, you know, he I've got dick pics on my phone from him. I was like, he's been trying to fuck half the females, you know, team like, it, no, there's got to be. And he was fucking Nolan's wife. And that's coming from him. Oh, shit. That was, yeah, that wasn't even from me. That was from him because I told him I said this is because we were cool at one point. And I said, hey, this is a rumor. Just FYI, this is being said about you. So whatever you're portraying as far as how how much favoritism you're showing her, like, keep this in mind. And he goes, how do you know about that? And I said, people talk, bro. And he was like, oh, fuck. He's like, no one's supposed to know about that. You know, blah, blah, blah. It was a while ago. And I was like, either way, dog, like, I don't want to tell you. And so I'm one of those people that if I hear a rumor, I'm like, hey, this is what's being said about you. But this is what I did to correct it. Yep. You know what I mean? So, you know, I, I called him out on it. And this was, you know, well before Nolan died. So when Nolan died and I was like, fuck that, this supervisor, you know, he, he had to have ulterior motive because it didn't make sense to me why he wouldn't let me go. Yeah. And so I was like, this makes sense. This is something I can wrap my brain around is, you know, he, he didn't give a fuck because, you know, he was sleeping with all the employees. He slept with Nolan's wife. Like it just, it was a whole thing. Right. So come to find out a conversation was overheard. And the only reason I believe this information is one, because of who it came from and two, what I know about our supervisors. Um, he, they said that they were all avoiding me like the plague because I was going out swinging and taking everyone down with me. Well, they all knew I had dirt on like pretty much every single one of them, but I, because I was blasting that one supervisor, they were like, oh shit, she's going to come after us next. Yeah. And I was like, no, I don't care. I have no problem with you. I know you're a piece of shit and I don't really care what you do behind your wife's back ain't none of my business because it didn't directly affect me. And so, but this one did. So I was like, hold on, time out. Something's not right here. So that's why they avoided me from what I heard. Again, that's hearsay. I don't know 100% how true that is, but again, I'm not surprised by it. So... Yeah. They just, they turn it into this whole thing of like, oh God, we can't speak to her. Like even me calling to get supplies was awkward. Like you could feel the tension. I'm like, what the fuck did I do to you? Um, so it was, it was a whole thing. And then I found out from Nolan's dad that because I had blasted, like I have a whole timeline of everything they did. Um, but yeah, I had a timeline of everything that they did, you know, stuff that wasn't adding up when I was trying to get through to people, they weren't calling me back. I wasn't getting text messages back. And so I sent it all to his parents because I was like, hey, here's the timeline. Well, they went back and fired back at his dad and said that they didn't take my text. My text message said, I need the biggest favor I'm ever going to ask for. And it's for one of our own. Well, I never got a response back. And so the legal statement that I saw, I saw the actual documentation from his dad. And it said, well, we didn't take her text message serious because she's always asking for favors. And I said, hold the fuck on. I said, the funny part is I don't delete anything. I have all the text messages of all the favors I've ever asked for. And the, if I needed a favor, as far as like coming in a little bit later, because I'm a yeah. single mom. So, hey, I'll move my shift back, but I'll give you an extra six hours of my time to cover into the night shift or whatever. Which that sounds like something that everybody does anyway. Yeah, everyone does it. Yeah. Um, and then also the the other half of that, of those favors was... I was like, Hey, I saw, you know, like levels are low or whatever the case was like, we get little vitals, they call them daily vitals. Um, 
Hey, I saw we're only at like 90% staffing for the day. Can I come in six hours early? Hey, can I stay six hours late and I'll help y'all with coverage? It was rarely wanting something in return or any time that they call it. If I was on shift and this happened with the supervisor that, you know, I, I called out. He said, hey, can you can you extend your shift tonight? And I told him flat out, I said, hey, I'm exhausted. I said, if you let me go home and sleep for a couple hours, I'll come back and I'll work the entire night shift. And I did. I went home. I slept for about four hours and I came back and I worked the complete opposite shift that I normally do because I was working days at the time. Mm-hmm. And I did. I would do stuff like that for them all the time. And it was, they, they always left out the side of it that, you know, they asked me for favors all the time, but it was always a give and take. It wasn't yeah. just a take, take, take kind of deal. So that was the, the official statement that they put out from our legal department because Nolan's dad told our CEO to, at the funeral that he was going to sue the shit out of him standing next to Nolan's grave, which, you know, as far as I know, nothing came of that. You know, they got in front of it and they were like, here's our legal statement. So I got, you know, told that, you know, mental health is so important and, you know, you have to take care of yourself. I got told by a supervisor that, um, I called him and I said, you know, Hey, I ran a call that hit a little too close to home. So I just need a little extra time at the hospital. And, uh, I, at the time I was on some like anti-anxiety meds mm-hmm. and I, I called a friend of mine. I said, Hey, can you run to my house and grab these? Like this, uh, this isn't sitting well. And he sure as shit did ran to my house. He grabbed the meds and he met me at the hospital. And I, I told my supervisor, I said, Hey, I just need a few extra minutes. He goes, okay, that's fine. But I need you to hurry. Cause we're busy. And I flat out told him, I said, I don't give two flying fucks if we're busy right now, because I am not okay enough to go out and God forbid work someone's child. Yeah. I cannot do that right now. Like I'm not okay. Um, so I got a lot of pushback if I ever, you know, if I was well, struggling. There. Well, let me ask you this. Cause I, I once again, don't know the procedures or nothing with any of that kind of stuff. Right. Mm-hmm. So with anything like that, is there, I don't know, procedure protocol. Don't know the actual words. Like if you say, Hey, I need a couple minutes or whatever. And there's no calls going on. Is there mm-hmm. someone like a counselor, someone that you're supposed to be able to call and talk to, to be like, Hey, look, I'm a little fucked up right now. Or do they just expect you just to be like, get back on the bus and go? Suck it up and go. Um, I have my counselor's number that yeah. I can text her and be like, hey, are you available? You know, obviously she has her own life outside of taking care of us. Um, but she's pretty good about answering her texts and phone calls and whatnot. So I, I'm lucky enough in that department. Yeah. Um, or, you know, calling friends or whatever the case is, like I have a good support system outside of work, but as far as work goes, we don't, we have, we have a team of people that are supposed to, they're not counselors by any means, they're providers too. Okay. Um, but they're supposed to be there as a support system. I have watched some of those team members use personal information that they got being on that team as gossip. So I'm like over my dead body. Am I calling any of y'all? Absolutely not. That's just my personal take on it. Yeah. Um, but we do, we do have them. I just, I wouldn't trust them as far as I could throw them because I've seen it use like weaponized and use as gossip. Yeah. I just, I don't know how to feel about that. And I, I'm not throwing you under the bus when I say this uh, or anybody in that field. Cause I'm not in that field. Right. Like it's just, I feel like you should get time, but also if you're at work, if they only have so many people at that time that are working, I could see from their point of view too, that where they're like, Hey, take your time when you're not working. Mm-hmm. Like you, you know what you signed up for, which still it, it's, it is it's true, dickish. Though. It's dickish now. Don't get me wrong. Cause like, if you're fucked up, you're fucked up and like, you're not going to do your job well. And at least you showed up to do your job and you're being vocal about not being okay. And then they should, you know, there's a difference between a boss and a leader, in my mm-hmm. opinion. And it's like, if you go to your boss and your boss is a desk jockey, and I don't know if your boss is a desk jockey or whatever, uh, but if he's a desk jockey and you go to your boss and be like, hey, I'm a little fucked up right now. This is why I'm fucked up. And they know that you're fucked up. It should be like, okay, well, take you a breather, talk to a counselor for a little bit, whatever. And I'll or even go, they came to talk or, to us. Or yeah, or like they sent somebody to talk to you right then and then let your your boss 
jump on the bus and take your, you know, a little bit of your shift. Like that's a leader. That's not a boss. Like yeah. if you're if you're short staff or even call somebody in for you. Like, We're always short staffed. Yeah, like that's what I'm saying. But being short staffed too, it causes a lot of problems. And I'm sure y'all are severely short staffed, like everybody mm -hmm. else. I can see both sides of it. I, I can see their I side. Can. Of I, I can see it from that, you know, it's still an emergency system. It's still a 911 system. We are here to yeah. take care of people. Yeah. But at the same time, if I've got them saying, you know, if, if that were me, and mind you, I've held, you know, manager level jobs, you know, in healthcare. If I had somebody call me saying they had a problem, my ass is showing up like, hey, what do we need to do to fix this? And I feel like it should be the same. Like if I had a supervisor show up to check on me and been like, hey, what do you need? Or even if I'm like, hey, if I'm running to the next call, because they can jump our calls, so they can show up, you know, and jump our calls. So if they had said, you know, if they watched my, because they can see all of our calls, what we're running to. And sure enough, after that, I got a critical call. I think I worked a cardiac arrest after that. I just remember running lights and sirens to a critical yeah. call right after this phone call. Not once did I have a supervisor show up on that call with me. Damn. And that that's the stuff that like really hurt my heart in the process of like, y'all really don't give a shit of you have this ability and you have the capabilities to support us and to help us and all of these things. And you're choosing not to. And this particular day I said, okay, well, I'm going to, I'm going to do my best. I said, I just, my friend's bringing my meds so that way I can function because at the point in time, I didn't carry my medication with me. Can I take it and still drive? Yes. But I was like trying to be strong, which is partially my fault. Yeah. I was trying to do that whole, like, I'm a strong, independent woman bullshit. And, <laughs> I, got this. That's <laughs> and funny. I did not got this. <laughs> so, you know, well, stuff like that. Is just... it, but also to give yourself a little bit of grace, you're, you were trying. I mean, the thing is you have to pick up the pieces and you have to go forward, but we're all going to have those days. I posted a video last night about this. Um, you're going to have those days. Like you could, you could be fine six days out of a week if you're trying to move forward but on that seventh day or whatever day of the week it is if you're struggling you have to allow yourself to struggle you're not healed like just because you're moving forward doesn't mean you're better you're just means that you refuse to stay in that one place it, you don't want to stay there like you don't want to stay in that hurt you don't want to stay in that misery you I want to stagnant yeah, you don't want to be stagnant. You want to move. Like, you want to move on. But there's going to be times you get jerked back. Mm -hmm. It happens to all of us. I got jerked back yesterday and don't know why. I can't I can't sit here and tell a single person why I got in my head and my feels and in a horrible mood yesterday about some stupid shit and don't know why. I, I've been so good lately. And yesterday, I just got in the worst mood. Like, for no you fucking know, reason. Do what? It's like a yo-yo. Yeah, it's yeah, I, and I cannot tell. Like I was te texting somebody last night, and it was like, "I'm in a foul ass mood today. I don't know really know what what it's about. I'm in my head. I don't know what's wrong with me. I know I'll be okay. Like I, I'm not worried about it, but right now, I'm having a pity party. And right I now, don't, I don't feel okay. Yeah, right now I don't feel okay. I know I'm gonna be okay, but it's like, where the fuck did this come from? And I think, though, the difference between a lot of people and even you acknowledging that you wasn't okay in that moment or me even just saying that right there, it's okay to not be okay. And it's okay to be vocal about it because the sooner you're vocal about it, the sooner you get over it. Well, you know? sometimes even having someone else be like, hey, I'm not feeling the best. This is, this is kind of, especially with like my situation, I do have full-blown PTSD flashbacks. Yeah. I was having full blown like panic attacks at work to where like I could almost feel it coming on. And if I had a patient in the back and this only happened once or twice, this is how I knew I went back to work too soon. Um, happened once or twice and I could hold it off until like, and luckily I had a solid partner that was like, I got this. And he's also one of my close friends. It would be one of those. I got this. Yeah. Take a breather. I'll pass off the patient, which we don't normally pass off patients, you know, one-on-one -on -one. it's we, we tag team it, you know, take two people in there. And he did, he took one for the team. He's like, take a breath before this, you know, spirals kind of deal. And, you know, there was, there was a time that I, we ran a psych patient and it was just like, I, 
we had a medic that passed away. It was a month to the day after Nolan's death. He died in a car accident. He was young. It was, it was devastating. I didn't know him that well, but if you know anything about first responders and you know, it's very common, obviously police, fire, and EMS, they do a last call on the radio and it's where you hear their name being called and we yeah. don't normally get called out by our names, but they, you know, they named the last day and time, last call they ran. Yeah, I do not like hearing these. Um, <laughs> they're hard. <laughs> they're Even hard. If not in the field, they're hard to listen yeah, to. Yeah, they are so, hard. Well, for this other medic's funeral, Aaron and I were sitting on a site call, like waiting out for PD to go find out what's going on with this little girl. This yeah. is another one. And we hear his last call come over the radio. And mind you, this was Nolan's partner, and who's, you know, we were all really close. And I'm sitting there and we're on the cycle. When we get back in the trucks, so we're waiting on PD. And it was like, as soon as I close that door, we hear his last call come over the radio. Ooh. And it hit me like a ton of fucking bricks. Because, you know, I mean, listening to listening to Nolan's last call, you got me and seven of our friends that we were all like inseparable. It was a weird dysfunctional family. Yeah. So at his funeral, and it's like, we all lost it. And part of it is we all know that we're eventually we're going to get that last call too. Yeah. It was just something that kind of sits and hits us a little bit harder. But hearing that kid's last call and he died literally a month to the day after Nolan's death, it was the weirdest Ooh. thing. And, you know, he's 22 years old. There's just so many things that were so heartbreaking. But then when that last call came on, I was like, oh my God, like this is devastating. So we get through this call and we go pick up the next one. I thought I was doing okay. And there was just something about it that hit. And I had a full blown panic attack in the back of that ambulance. Like I'm talking, I was shaking. I couldn't breathe. You know, I, I called a supervisor when I, I felt it coming and I said, Hey, I, I need a minute. Like this is, this is going to be bad. And he was like, who's your partner again today? And I told him, he said, okay. He said, I, I know, I know you're good. I said, I got to get out of the hospital district. I said, I just can't be here right now. I just got to get out of, we've got like seven hospitals in one area. I said, I'm just, we need to go down the road cause I'm not doing okay. And I don't want my coworkers that are, you know, dropping patients off to be like, Hey, how's it going? I'm in the back, like a crying mess. So Aaron, he is such a smart man. I'll never admit that to his face though. Um, he drove me to Brahms. Yeah. Literally took me to go get ice cream. And he, he stood there and he said, do you want to be by yourself? I said, I don't know. And he stood there in the, in the wheel well and let me just cry the shit out. And I was, mm -hmm. I was hyperventilating. I was like, I just don't understand, you know, and this is like a month after his funeral. And I'm just like, I just don't understand. Like, did, did I do something to deserve this? And, you know, like, what the fuck happened? Because I was still in that mindset of I don't understand. So, you know, having some grace when stuff like that happens, like when that particular supervisor, he did show me some grace and compassion. He said, call me if you need anything. And I said, okay. I said, I just, I just need to get this. I was like, it's going to be bad. And he didn't ask me more questions. He didn't push. And he said, okay. And he, you know, he called me, it's about 10 minutes that I was like starting to come down and he calls me and he said, do you need more time? I said, give me about five more minutes. And I think I'll be okay. I said, I'm just, I'm just, and he could hear it on the phone. So I'm just catching my breath. And he said, okay. He said, do I need, do I need to come get you? Do you need to go home? He's like, you tell me what you need and I'll make it happen. So stuff like that meant a lot, but I, that was very few and far between. And, you know, when fast forward to, I went in to go talk to one of my executives and I said, Hey, I need to talk to you about like intermittent FMLA. Cause there was a couple of days that I couldn't even, couldn't even get myself out of bed. Like it took everything I had just to like go brush my teeth. And I sat down and I said, Hey, I need to talk to you about this. Cause I, I need to do something. Cause I called off work. I think it was two or three times. I got a write up for that. I was like, cool kind of taking mental health days yeah uh, don't get me wrong we have attendance points like it is it is we can use them for anything but i'm like this is a like direct work related thing like why am i not getting some sort of grace of like i and it, those days i did call my therapist um it was it was one of those of just like hey i i don't need to be on an ambulance because at this point i'm so not okay that i'm afraid i'm gonna kill somebody yeah you know what I mean? Like, I, I know my limits. I will push them. But it was, you know, I was getting these these disciplinary actions, basically, when I was trying my best to take care of myself so that I could take care of other people. Um, technically, my PTSD diagnosis is a direct work injury, essentially. 
Um, I don't know how that works. I don't really care because I'm not going to like not work. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's, you know, I went in and talked to her about intermittent FMLA. Like, Hey, on these days that I'm having bad days, can I get protected by FMLA and use those hours? Um, and she, you know, she's like, well, I guess, you know, I can, I can talk to you. I can send you the information on it. And I said, okay, perfect. Well, then it turned into a whole lecture about how my entire friend group is toxic and how I need to be more mindful of how people perceive me. I don't know if you figured this out yet, but I'm one of those people that I don't really give two flying fucks when people think about me. Yeah, I can tell. <laughs> people talk about me. They, you know, rumors. I learn something new about myself every time I go to work. Hey, you ain't the only one, bro. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those. I'm like, my life really isn't this exciting, but I'm glad y'all think so. Like, I go to work and I go home. It's really not yeah. that. I'm out here sleeping with half the company, apparently. And I was like, well, clearly he was terrible because I don't remember being there. Ah. <laughs> like, it's just stuff like that. And so... She, my thing was to say what you want about me. But the second my friends started getting dragged into it, I was like, absolutely the fuck not. Yeah. I was like, call me toxic all you want. You know, she's like, you need to be more mindful of how people perceive you. And instead of helping me with just the thing that I asked for, it turned into a lecture of basically how my entire friend group were shitty people. Yeah. I was like, this isn't okay. Um, so I was like, I'll never speak to you again. Absolutely not. Um, so I just got, I got a lot of stuff like that. And then I got told, you know, oh, your mental health is so important. Bitch, where? Like, where, where did you guys prioritize anything to do with my mental health? Cause last time I checked, you were just making it worse. Yeah. Like you're dragging my name through the mud. You're saying, you know, supervisors saying they're avoiding me because I'm taking everyone out with me. And I'm like, the fuck, are you kidding me? So in the midst of all this, we get a, uh, an after action review, which is not uncommon. Uh, basically the city came in and we first, I got an email that says it was mandatory. And this is three months after his death it says it was mandatory. I said, what the fuck is this? I said, did any of y'all stop and think how three months later, like I've been doing all this healing, you know, I've been doing all my counseling stuff, paying for it on my own, like doing everything I can to be okay. And you're going to hit me with a mandatory review. Did you even stop and think how that's going to affect me? Yeah. And then because I fired back in that email, I was like, no, I said, this is bullshit. Uh, you know, they changed their tune. They're like, oh, well, it's not mandatory now. And I said, okay, I'll, I'll go. I'll be open-minded. I said, can one of my friends go with me? Cause they interviewed all of us separately. I said, can one of my friends go with me? And they said, no, we have to interview you separately. I said that right there doesn't sound, it sounds fishy you know, we were all involved or like we knew him and you're getting every perspective. Like that sounds fishy. And so then I said, okay, can his, can Nolan's fire mentor? Cause he, he stepped in and he's, he checks on me regularly. He's been nothing but helpful. I said, can he come with me? You know, he's a firefighter. He's not associated with our city or service area at all. He's a couple cities over. I said, can, can he go with me? Just so I'm not doing this by myself. I'm walking into a room full of strangers to go tell the story of the most heartbreaking day in my life by myself. And they said, no, we're not going to allow that. I said, okay. And so one of my friends who, you know, we've known each other for years, he is a first responder chaplain. I said, deny this one because he's a whole ass chaplain. He specializes in first responders and is a retired police officer. So, you know, he knows that the gory details are going to be rough to listen to, but he's offering to go as support. And they said, no, you have to do this by yourself. So, okay. Well, that, that also sounds fishy, but fuck it. I'm just going to go in and tell the truth. It's all I got for, got going for me. If I lose my job because of it, whatever. Um, that was my fears. Like I was getting set up to lose my job for telling the truth. Yeah. I'm like, this sounds so out of, out of whack. And so why do you I went, think that, why do you think that is though? Because his dad threatened to sue. Uh, and I was the only one that had screenshots, timelines, phone records like i had everything that could have assisted their their you loss were pretty, you were pretty much a loose end pretty much yeah yeah so and they are known for any any time it's it's kind of like a unwritten like unofficial thing but everyone knows anytime a female has come out and tried to report anybody higher up for sexual harassment or has made a big deal out of it they lose their job yeah and you know i tell them all the time i'm a damn good paramedic but i'm a shitty employee because i do not give these supervisors respect unless they earn it like if you're going to be an asshole to me i'm gonna do it right back 
Like I'm human. I'm not going to sit here and kiss the ground you walk on just because you wear a different colored shirt than I do. Yeah. You know, it's just, it's human respect and they don't like that. And especially the fact that I'm a woman and do it, it's, it doesn't sit right with some of them. <laughs> um, but I know that and I will own up to it that yes, there are days I'm an asshole. I will tell you hundred percent why everybody is though. Like, yeah. I, I just, I don't, I don't know. I, <laughs> I just hate when people use that as an excuse to make somebody else look bad. Yeah. Well, this is where it gets like super, this is where I kind of hit one of my final breaking points with them. Yeah. Um, we did the after action review and the lady that set it up, she said she's one of our executives. She's the same one that called me toxic, but whatever. Um, she said, Hey, you're doing this after action review. I know it's going to be a lot. Cause I was going on shift right after or nights. So I said, you know, I'll do it. Um, but that was my big thing is I wasn't driving 30 minutes into downtown to go do this on my day off. I was like, I'll do it while I'm on shift. You have to pay me for it. Um, so they did. And, you know, she said, if you need more time before you go on shift, cause mine was going to be the longest. I had the most information, you know, I had all the proof, the screenshots, everything that, you, you know, they knew mine was going to be pretty in depth. And so mine was about, I think almost two hours for my interview. Mm -hmm. I went through all this. And so she said, if you need extra time, let me know and I'll clear it with dispatch and keep you out of service for a little bit longer. She said, the supervisors are aware. Everyone knows that this is the deal and, you know, just call me when you're done. And I said, okay. So I called her and I said, Hey, that was two hours worth. That was a lot. I said, I, I just need a little time to decompress before I go out and tackle the big city. Um, so she, she did, she cleared it with dispatch and she said, I want you and your partner to go get something to eat. She said, I want you to take, take as much time as you need, you know, obviously within reason. Yeah. It don't take the whole shift, just sitting there at the restaurant, just chilling. But we did, we went and sat down and I was still in tears. I was like, that was so much. It was so overwhelming. You know, my partner was supportive. And then next thing you know, it's about, I think 45 minutes later that I was still just in tears and, you know, but I was starting to get myself together I Get a call from a supervisor and I'd text the, I think I'd text the executive. I know I talked to her on the phone. But uh, I get a call from a supervisor that says, if you don't go into service right now, you're going home. I said, what? I said, am I going to get an attendance point for this? And he's like, I don't know. We need this truck and service. And he goes, are you okay? And I was like, I don't even know yet. Yeah. And he goes, well, you've been out of service long enough. I said, long enough? I said, my meeting alone was two hours, dog. Like, what do you mean? Yeah, that's, a, like, that's a dickish. I mean, that's... You can't, a you can't put a... Once again, I got to play both sides of it. One, they need you because they're short staff. Two, you cannot tell somebody they're okay when they're not okay. All right. So what happens if you get out on the road and you break down and you just have a mental fucking meltdown when you're supposed to be working on somebody and then that person's family sues the shit out of that company? Because they sent someone out into the road who's already claimed that they're not okay and that they need some more time. They're going to get the shit sued out of them. Or they're going to push it on us and we're going to get it. We are personally going to get a malpractice lawsuit. Yeah. That's insane. So it's, it, it was, and it's like, I understand it. I understand. I really do understand where they're coming from. It's the, it was the way that it was presented and delivered of just like, sorry about your luck. And I'm like, a little compassion and empathy would have probably been like, you know what? I get it. I signed up for this. This is my job. But to have been told by somebody who is higher up than they are, you know, like take as much time as you need. You know, she's like, I don't even care if it's an hour. And to be told, oh, you've been out of service long enough. I'm like, what the fuck does that mean? Excuse me, sir. <laughs> Why, what do you mean long enough? Like my whole ass interview was two hours of reliving in detail, watching this man that I was building a life with, you know, lose his game of Russian roulette. What the fuck do you mean? Like take a walk in my shoes for a second and see, let's see how well you're doing. And, you know, I told, there's one supervisor, he's kind of a dick, but like, I, I appreciate him. Like I respect him, but he comes across as an asshole. And I told I'm him. I'm pretty sure that's how everybody I know describes me to a T. <laughs> me too. I'm pretty sure that's exactly what they say about me when I'm not around. Oh, I know the feeling. Don't don't feel bad. We're in the same club. Um, but he actually, I told him 
what Nolan said. And like the last thing Nolan said to me before he pulled that trigger and he goes like his jaw hit the ground. He goes, holy shit. He goes, I had no idea. I said, yeah, because this whole company has covered shit up. And he looked like he was about in tears. He goes, please, if you ever need anything, call me. Yeah. So there's only two supervisors that truly checked on me, like without being told to another one, he did check on me, but he was told to, um, which is fine. I still, I still appreciate it, but it wasn't like, he didn't know what was going on because they hid so much of it. Like they had no idea the stuff that led up to Nolan's death. And so, you know, it was a lack of compassion and empathy that like really took a toll on, on my mental health and, you know, his birthday came and went and I went in trying to, I said, Hey, I fucked up. I said, I didn't request his birthday off. I said, but because we work 12 hour shifts, I said, I'll, I'll, I'll do you a, I'll kind of trade with you. I said, if you give me his birthday off, cause I don't know how I'm going to be mentally that day. I said, I'll add six hours to my shift the day before and six hours to the day after. So you get two days with 18 hour coverage with a, an advance, an ALS truck. And he's, he was like, <laughs> the supervisor said to me, he goes, well, PTSD doesn't go away. So the fuck are you going to do the next year and the next year and the next year and the next year? And I was like, excuse me, like, this is the first one, bro. Can you give me a little bit of grace? And I just looked at him. And I immediately started crying. And uh, he just kind of looked at me and I was like, I'm doing my fucking best, bro. I've been ignoring his birthday this entire month because I, I wasn't looking forward to it. And he's like, well, PTSD doesn't go away, which I found out from my therapist that it actually does with the right, the right work. So he can stick that in his pipe and smoke it. Um, but I said, Hey, I said, I'll even come in and teach that day, but just don't put me on the streets. Like not, I said, I am sitting in the same seat every day that I watched him die in, like put me in a different environment just for the day. Yeah. Like, cause I don't, I don't know how I'm going to react. Like my PTSD is different than the next person's and theirs is different than the next person. I don't know how I'm going to be, this is new. There's no handbook. So he, he gave me this lecture about how, you know, PTSD doesn't go away, this, that, and the other. And basically I needed to suck it up. I was like, motherfucker. So I'm sitting there and I'm crying and I was like, I'm doing my best. He goes, honestly, he goes, you're actually enjoyable to be around. He was like, you were so angry and insufferable when you first came back. And I was like, I came back three days after (laughs) his fucking funeral. Yeah. There wasn't much you could do. And I was, I was traumatized. I was angry. I was grieving. Like, did I not have a right to be emotional? Who the fuck are you? Like, I have a certain name for the supervisor. Yeah. I think I called him that to his face. Ah. Um, It is what it is. But, you know, stuff like that. I'm just like, was I not allowed to be grieving? Yeah. Three days after his fucking funeral. And I still come back to the same seat that I watched him blow his fucking brains out two weeks ago. Yeah, that seems unfair on so many levels that you even had to deal with it. Like, it, I mean, it, it seems so unjust. Well, and have it said to my face was just like, wow, that's like insult. You just spit on in my face with that one. Like, go fuck yourself. So it, that was that was rough. Um, about six months, six months after this, is about a month ago, they finally offered to start paying for counseling. And. I can't remember what brought it up. I think it had to do with Nolan's mom fighting for me, like behind my back, you know, trying to stand up for me and like going to bat for me. She's like, why the fuck isn't she being taken care of? She's like, yes, that was his girlfriend. That is a provider in your system. You know, like she, she has dealt with the city more than she has my company. Um, But finding out that she actually went to bat for me was, was a big comfort for me of like, okay, she doesn't blame me. Like my company was blaming me. Um, so to have her, like have her in my corner, um, was a big turning point in my healing process and having yeah. her step for me and tell me that, you know, she's like, you're part of our family now was, I mean, cause the first time I met his mom was at his funeral. Yeah. You know, his casket's behind me. And that's the first time I met this woman and she has been nothing but kind to me and sweet and all the things. So they finally offered to start paying for some, some therapy. And I got a call from the executive because I, I actually got a text from my counselor and she said, Hey, so-and-so is asking me if like, you're still a patient, like you're still a client of mine. She goes, what do you want me to tell her? And I said, you can tell her you still see me, but nothing else. And she's like, you know, obviously your information is protected. So I text that executive and I said, you crossed the fucking line. Like how, the, no, no, ma'am. If you have a question about my counseling, 
and my stuff, you come to me. I said, you don't need to go behind my back asking her if she's still seeing me. Um, I said, that's a hard, that's a hard line for me. And she's like, well, I just wanted to make sure blah, 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 blah. And I said, you know what? I said, I've been paying, I've been going as often as I could because I'm paying for this out of pocket. And she's like, well, I didn't know that. I said, yes, you did. Cause I told you the night he died that I had used up all my, you know, stuff. We get like six free sessions. Yeah. Um, I said, you know, I, I told you that the night he died. She's like, well, I didn't know. And I was like, well, then you weren't paying attention. I don't know what to tell you. And so she's, she told me, she said, you can't say that we haven't done anything for you. I said, yes, I can. Cause y'all haven't done shit. And she said, well, you know, I'm paying for your, we're paying for your counseling now. I said, yeah, six months later. I said, I'm not sound. I don't want to sound ungrateful. I appreciate it, but you don't get to sit here and tell me, you know, unless you can give me an itemized list of what y'all have done for me, I'll wait for it. Like, please tell me, cause if I'm missing something and I haven't been appreciative enough, like I want to be aware of that. First yeah. of all, I don't want, cause obviously grief is blinding and you know, life is crazy. But if, if I miss something, please tell me. And I got nothing. And I was like, okay. So we ended up making amends because Nolan's mom got him put on a memorial that is specifically for first responders and veterans here in Texas. Yeah. Um, she made she made the deadline by like the day of to get his name on this memorial. And it's the first one for veterans and first responders who have lost their life to suicide. Um, they're trying to end the stigma and all that stuff. So we had this memorial the next day, which this executive was going to. And I found out that the day prior she had gone to a like support group kind of deal, whatever. And she didn't realize that I had a couple friends in that meeting that she, you know, they don't, they don't work with us. Like these are just people that I know outside of this. And, uh, they're like, Hey, is this your Nolan? And I was like, yeah. And turns out she went to some support group for like PTSD for first responders. And she was telling Nolan's story, but making it 100% about her. And I was like, you had better be fucking joking. Like, you know, his, it just, it was such a slap in the face of you are not going to use his death to benefit you because you don't know if you're going to have a fucking job next year. I was angry, like angry, angry. So when I saw her at this memorial, we were walking through and the stage is there and she goes, oh, I wonder if they'll let me speak. It took everything I had not to lose my ever loving mind and just be like, this isn't about you. This is about the people that have lost their lives because people fucking let them down or they didn't ask for help or the signs weren't noticeable. What th This is about them and their family. This has nothing to do with you. Um, so I just. That kind of sent me on a tipping point of more into the anger phase, but it's just, it, I've been, I've been ignored. I've been dragged through the mud. I've been called every name in the book I have. And I kept quiet for a very long time. I kept quiet because I was, I was told basically that I was irrational, that my, my grief was basically just, I had to be quiet about it. Yeah. And one thing that one of the firewives told me, she said, your grief deserves to be acknowledged just like everyone else's. And she's like, and I've watched you grieving quietly. And I was like, damn, that, that hit so hard because I kept everything to myself. I kept everything, you know, trying to make sure there was no drama at his funeral, trying to make sure that, you know, I didn't put anything on his parents, my friends that were here that were taking care of me. You know, I didn't want to burden them with anything. I was for the first couple months I was hiding my drinking. I was, you know, I'd go in my closet and I'd cry by myself. Like I didn't want anybody to see that. And the one thing I've learned is that I can't, I can't do this by myself for yeah, one. You can't, I can't, it's too much. It's, it's too much. And that it's, it is okay to stand up for myself. Absolutely. It is. I sat there and I let them, I let this company drag me through the mud. I let them push the blame on me. And I had that survivor's guilt of, did I, did I miss something? You know, I already, I already was going through everything. I'm like, did I miss the signs? You know, what could I have done better? Did I, did I not call the right person? You could have saw every single sign and it still wouldn't help. I hope you know that. Like, I like do I, now. Yeah. It's like I told you on the first show, I don't care what anybody says. It's not that the person wants to die. They're just tired of living. Like there's nothing you could have done. 
and I know that now. Yeah. And I know, you know, after picking apart that last conversation, I know part of him thought that he was protecting me and everyone else from him because he thought he was such a disappointment. And, you know, it's like, that's heartbreaking. And he, he was exhausted. Like I could see the mental and like the physical toll that exhaustion was taking on him. Yeah. And he was, he was sick. Like, that's really what it comes down to is this PTSD shit is like a cancer patient. You can't see it. No. There. No, it's, it's like, a, I know I told you earlier today and I'm not comparing my stuff to his whatsoever, but like yesterday when my shit came around, it was literally exhausted with life. That And like, when you get to that point, luckily I know and if anybody's listening to me right now, I want you to please understand what I'm about to say. I have dealt with this long enough that I know that I'm just tired right now, but my batteries are going to recharge. There's a lot of people that when they get to where they're that exhausted with life, they don't understand that their batteries are going to recharge. They think that that low is going to be that low forever. That you're, it is- It's not going to be. You're going to have those bad days and it's cliche. It's a bad day. It's not a bad life. I I always love the saying that, you know, you've made it through every day. You've said it was the worst day of your life and you're still here. Mm -hmm. You're going to make it through every bad day of your life. Well, and some of those bad days have helped, at least me personally, have helped me appreciate the good stuff. Oh yeah. Yeah so much good around and even even the stuff with like that I dealt with going back to work and how you know I took it personal of just like oh my god my grief is too much okay I'm I'm the problem I'm the asshole I'm insufferable whatever which I know there were days that I was um but ultimately how they treated me was on them yeah I think I think that they should have showed you a lot more grace I think they should have realized that what you were going through at the time was such a struggle and such a mind fuck. It was traumatic. Yeah, it's it's uh, uh, something that everybody does, and they just don't understand they're doing it until they take a step back. Everybody wants to sit there, and they want to say that what they have been through and their trauma is worse than your trauma. Mm-hmm. But But the truth is trauma is trauma. Your brain and my brain are going to literally think if I sit here and I say that the worst thing that's ever happened to me was me losing my ex and her getting married one day to somebody else, that might be the most traumatic and hurtful thing in my life. Yours is Nolan. No one in either one of the, and and like to us, I can't tell you that yours is more traumatic to me than me being more traumatic than you. Like they're both in our brains are going to register the same amount of trauma. Now telling the other person that you're supposed to say, oh, they're equal will never make sense to another human being on the planet. But they're literally the same amount of trauma if there was a scale in our brains. We as humans don't like admitting that. No, No one likes to sit there and say that. But everybody's been through some shit. Everybody's been through something to where you're fucked up because of that shit. And you're supposed to have an understanding of that to where when I look at you and I know that you've been through some stuff, instead of me sitting here saying, well, you haven't been through what I've been through. So suck it up. I'm supposed to say, I don't know what you've been through. I don't know how you're dealing with it, but I know how I've dealt with the stuff that I've gone through and I haven't dealt with it good. And it's weighing on me. So I'm supposed to show you grace. Mm. I wanted somebody to show me grace when I was struggling. So I need to show you grace. But a lot of people don't do that. A lot of people just want to project. A lot of people want to think that theirs is worse or that their experiences are worse than yours. And that's not okay. And I think that that's what they were probably doing to you. They probably were just like, God, I wish this bitch hush and just get back to work. <laughs> like we've been We've been doing this for 20 years. Like we've been doing this forever, 30, whatever it is. Like we've seen way worse shit. Suck well, it up. Do your job. With that though, with the the time, like the 20, 30 years marker that just reminded me, the way that I just accepted the way that they were treating me and just brush it off as that's that's a them problem, not a me problem. Yeah. Is when I talked 
to the supervisor that actually worked Nolan. Because had he not been there, I would have been the one that had to, you know, work him and terminate resuscitation and pronounce his death, right? Yeah. And that's up in itself. Um, but I talked to the supervisor. This is, I think I was back for like three, four weeks. But I told him, I said, hey, I never got to thank you. I know, I know you did everything you could. And I know it was so chaotic that I didn't get to talk to you afterwards. And I, I do appreciate you. And he looked, mind you, he's been doing this like 38 years or some shit like that. Like longer than I've been alive. And he looked at me and he started tearing up. He said, I'm so sorry. There wasn't more I could do. And I said, no, I know you did everything that you could. Like from a medical standpoint, I know you did everything once you got up there. That's cool. And he looked at me. He said, I'll be honest with you, Kayla. I've been doing this 38 years. He said, I've never taken a call home. He said, I've learned to compartmentalize. He said, I've never had something stick with me. He goes, this is the first one in 38 years that I don't know what to do with. He said, I don't know how to process it. I don't know how to get past it. I don't know how to work around it. And I looked at him and I was like, I'm so sorry. No one, no one has really stopped. I think, I don't know how many people have stopped and asked him how he's doing. Um, and I, I'm guilty of that too, because I was so focused on my own grief. But the fact that somebody who's been doing this 38 years and has never really struggled this hard with one call. And don't get me wrong, we've had other providers that have, you know, died by suicide and whatnot. And it's like, this one hit him like a freight train. I said, okay, this isn't, you know, one, it's not just about me, first and foremost. Two, that goes to show that I'm not crazy in how I feel. Like, I'm not overreacting in how I feel. I may be projecting it differently than he does, but I'm not out of line for how I feel. Yeah. And it was a, it was a perception thing of like, you know, these, this man has been doing it 40 fucking years. And he was like, this is the first one that I don't know what to do with. I don't know which way is up with this one. And I was like, holy shit. Like, you know, obviously I've been doing it nearly as long as he has, but it's, you know, the, those 20, 30 years, you know, those, even the people that have been doing it like 15, you know, 10, 15 years, they were looking at me like I was crazy. Yeah. And I'm like. I, I would not wish this on anyone. I just wish there was a way to make people understand that like you, like you said, processing trauma, different trauma, trauma. Yeah. You could have been sitting next to me, been Nolan's best friend watching the same thing that I did. And you're going to process it differently than I do. Yep. Everyone's going to, you can have the exact same fucking trauma and you're going to process it differently than the person standing next to you. You know, people like in 9-11 that survived, you know, Twin Towers, they process it differently. The first yeah. response all process it differently, but it's the same trauma. Yeah. Look at, Pete, da look at Pete Davidson. I don't know if you know who that is or not, the comedian. His dad was a firefighter. I think he's a firefighter. He's either a firefighter or he worked in the towers. I can't remember. But it fucked him up so bad that he started making jokes about it and became a comedian because of it. And that's how he gets it out there. That's how he gets it. And I'm sure it pisses a lot of people off when he used to make those jokes. I don't know if he still does now, but like that's his trauma response. I have, and I'm a, sure I have a similar trauma response. So yeah. I can't for it. Do what? I have a similar trauma response. I, well, I, but... I make, I make jokes when I'm uncomfortable. I make jokes. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm very, I'm very bad about that. Uh, but to me, it's just like, once again, I, I know I said it and I know we got to wrap up in a second, but I said it when we kind of started, but you know, it's already happened to you. Like, that's the thing. It's already happened to you. You can't go back. You can't change it. It's not that you have to make light of the situation by any means, but you have to move on. And how you move on is your is 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 up to you. For me, making light out of a situation, making light out of a situation helps me because it takes like some of the anger out of me. It takes some of the hurt out of me. And plus, I usually know like if I'm making light out of a situation, I know that the person who's not here anymore, they probably would have wanted me to. They probably oh, I would be laughing his ass off. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like they, they would have wanted me to, I don't care if somebody else thinks that shit or not. Like just because you and him didn't have that relationship or you and her didn't have that relationship. Me and them did. 
and they would have wanted me busting their balls in the afterlife. They would have wanted me talking shit. Mm -hmm. They would. They wouldn't want me sitting here sad. Oh, I still talk shit like he's standing right next to me. Like yeah. I came home, and I swear my house is haunted now. But I came home, and I have a picture of me and him right there. Yeah. And nobody'd been home, and the picture was moved. And I walked in, and I was like, that, "That's not where that was when I left this morning." And I straight up yelled at him. I said, "If you're gonna move shit, at least dust the, the shelf. <laughs> like, be productive." That's good. That's good. You know, it's you just gotta you and you, it's okay to take that stuff with you. Yeah. As long as you're still moving. Absolutely. Because like this, this grief is something that will never go away. It's the the PTSD. You know, I may be able to work through that hopefully. But it's it's part of it's part of the, the whole journey of yes. as long as I keep putting one foot in front of the other and it's it's a process I've had to learn. I've had to learn that it's okay to stand up for myself. Yep. It's okay to protect myself. Um, which in that process, I am getting ready to start a new chapter. And I'm actually I haven't told them yet, but I'm leaving that company. Um I'm surprise, going to <laughs> surprise. Yeah. I'm trying to get all my like stuff, my CEs and stuff downloaded before they lock me out and I lose all this work that I've done, you know, to be able to renew my license. But it's I'm I'm getting ready to type up my resignation letter. Um you know this episode's like coming out today or tomorrow. I know. I, none of them know. None of my coworkers know unless they're like my close people. Yeah. But even if they see it, I don't really care because I'm about to send it in today anyways. Oh, uh, okay. Fuck yeah. But uh, it's, I get to go, you know, the department that I'm at now, the application was supposed to be Nolan's. Yeah. I started there part-time, fell in love with it, and they offered me a full-time spot. That's cool. And I get to, I get to move on to this next chapter and I get to do it someplace that I'm happy. I get to leave the toxic shit behind and learn from it and grow from it and hopefully help the next generation of first responders that are dealing with, you know, whatever their form of trauma is and their form of like heartbreak and devastation, even if it's just from the job or personal life, like this life sucks some days, yeah, but it gets better. Well, I think that you're going to do an amazing job with what actually is meant to be your job. I think you're doing a great job of what you're doing now, but I think that what's actually meant for you to do is you're going to really help some people. I can already tell, dude. Like, it's, I know I told you a lot on the first episode. So if you're listening to this one and you haven't listened to the other ones, go back because I'm not going to get in that whole spill again. <laughs> but yeah, just you're, you're made for this. Like, you are. You've got the demeanor. Like, you've got the same demeanor that I have to where you can be sensitive, but you can be approachable and funny. And you can take something that's taboo, but make it to where it's not necessarily taboo. Uh, that is a skill that not many people have. You you have the ability, the same as I do, to where you can talk about a suicide and it doesn't taste like shit coming out of your mouth, and it doesn't it doesn't make somebody cringe when they hear it. And that's how I know just listening to you, like you you were meant to help people in this way. And you're you're gonna make a difference, and it's gonna be like I told you on the first episode. Like it's gonna be with him by your side. This is this was a game plan. Like this was God's game plan. It's not the game plan that his family or you or anybody else wants. But I would imagine if he would have known that he still would have accepted the task. You know that's that's that was one thing that we don't know, and we never know until we get to our destination. We always bitch and complain about the journey of things. We are always just aggravated by the journey, but we're never aggravated by the destination. But if it wasn't for the journey, we wouldn't get to the destination. And I think for your situation, the journey's hell. The journey's just so just heartbreaking and it hurts. But that destination is going to help so many people that you're going to look back on the journey and be like, thank you, God. Like, and that's hard to say about a suicide or somebody being gone. But well, they say there's, there's a theory of like, they call it soul contracts. Yeah. Like you agreed on what is in that soul contract before you come into this life. This is what you agreed upon. And the funny part is, is one of the last things that Nolan said to me, he said, you know, my soul is tied to yours. I'm going to find you in the next life. There's a whole nother thing about soul ties that him and I never talked about. 
it's kind of like those soul ties become like who, who comes into your life becomes like your, your soul, your soul tribe. Right. Yeah. Of those people that you're meant to meet. Yeah. And the fact that he said that where I've never heard him use that. Mind you, ever, I got, like, you ever seen, stuff. you ever seen the movie, what dreams may come? Oh my God. Yes. And it makes me cry every time. I love that movie. I just watched it recently. Um, yeah, that's, if you, nobody's ever watched that movie, go watch it. What dreams may come. Uh, but yeah, that's kind of it. Like, dude, that's, there's just not enough people that appreciate the pain and they let it like destroy them. You haven't let it destroy you. And actually for this being six months later, seven months later, you're, I don't mean it in a disrespectful way. You're very upbeat. You're very upbeat. And for the fact that you're upbeat, that just goes to show you that you're on the right path. I'm I'm real big on little victories and little like little road signs that point you like I like little rewards, little victories to where it's like, hey God, just let me know I'm going in the right direction. You ain't got to tell me what my destination is. You ain't got to let me know my purpose. Just let me know I'm going in the right direction. And when I start to veer, let everything go to hell. Like, let everything just go bad. And it just seems like with you, you're going in the right direction because your outlook, your, your outlook and you get in the new job and, and all this kind of stuff. Like, you're, you're doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing. So I, I want you to like, and, and that's anybody listening too, like, it's okay to not be where you want to be but you're where you're you're where you're supposed to be it's it's definitely been it's been a journey and as far as the beat part goes it's you know i've walked through hell at this point yeah i've walked through hell and i came out the other side it's you know like i said i've survived some things that would have knocked most people on their ass and i did it i may not have done it with a smile on my face all the time and you know those bad days still come and it's okay for those bad days to still come yeah. as long as i keep putting one foot in front of the other and i hope you do i hope you do well tell everybody real quick before we get off here where they can find you on social media um, on tiktok or whatever and if they want to reach out how they can get in touch with you on social media and then i will get out of here and i want to thank you this was three great episodes you're great at this and what I will probably do, um, and I extend this to some of our guests, not all of them. If you come across anybody on social media that you that has a great story that'll help people, um, make sure you get them in touch with me. But I'm willing to have you and people that you that reach out to you back on the show to share their stories, and all of us do like group shows and everything like that to help people. Um, like I said, these stories on our own. Well, we're not supposed to keep these stories locked up. Like these are not supposed to be, you don't go through this shit to harbor it. You go through the stuff you've gone through to put it out into the world. So it helps others. You're still here and you're still kicking because you're supposed to be. And I just love that you took probably the worst experience in your life and you're doing something about it to help others. That, that shows that you You've got something special to you. And I, I'm proud to just, I'm proud to know you. Don't oh, make me cry again. <laughs> That's my job. Oh, I did make you cry last time. So I guess we're oh, you, did. you did. You did. You did. You did. You got <laughs> I me would absolutely times. love to talk to anybody who needs to, your lieutenant friend, anybody who needs, even if they just want somebody who understands or maybe sees it from a different perspective, like feel free to give them my contact information. And that goes for anybody else who stumbles across this. Um, I am on TikTok. It's Madhouse89. Um, I use that more than Instagram. Um, so you can send me a message, whatever the case is. But if you just, even if you just need somebody to listen at yeah. this point, there have been days that I just needed somebody to listen. And, you know, I was lucky enough to have that. And I know not everyone has the support system that I do. And I'm more than happy to pay it forward. And hopefully, hopefully we can get a little bit of that stigma away from you know suicide and mental health in general and Absolutely. first responders especially it's it's life's not meant to be lived alone and Absolutely. sometimes you need a little extra help. Absolutely. Well thank you so much. I appreciate you doing this and yeah I just look forward to getting to know you better and doing some more episodes and seeing where you go and how you how you help people with this. Well I'll be in Georgia and we're gonna go get a drink too. Oh dude I'm down. You know I'm down. Uh <laughs> 
Well, anyway, well, folks, go follow her. If you need help, please reach out to not just us, but also there's a lot of people out there you can reach out to, but no, you're not alone. No, it's okay to ask for help. I've asked for help. Everybody's asked for help. It's nothing to be ashamed of. I sat here and told y'all when we first started this, that like yesterday was a bad day for me. The difference between me and some folks is I know that it's going to be over. It's going to be over. Uh, I can't remember the actual Bible verse, um, but it's pretty much as if uh, if you sit there and you think about it too long uh, and the devil comes for the night, if you will let him stay, he'll stay. But if you will ignore him, he'll be gone in the morning. And that's what you got to do sometimes. And when you start ignoring that devil and start ignoring your demons, it's funny how they're gone in the morning and that sun comes out and you got a whole different outlook on life. Uh, you just got to get over those demons in that darkness at night sometimes. Um, it's a whole new day every day. So that's what I want you guys to focus on. Uh, I love each and every one of y'all. Thank y'all for listening to the Josh Terry podcast. I will catch y'all next time.